Putting on my top hat, tying up my white tie, brushing up my tail. Welcome to Hatcast, the podcast about hats. We're a little rusty. It's been a while. That's right. It's been over a week. Although, if you're listening to the episodes right in a row, you won't know the difference. Uh, well, that's true. Yeah, but if you've been eagerly awaiting this for the last couple of weeks, I apologize for the summer hiatus. And if you were listening to the episodes just in a row and you weren't eagerly awaiting it, we've already told you it's been more than a week, so you now know it. I'm Charles Berman. And I'm Carl Bernhardson. We're here to talk about... Hats. That's right. This is the program about hats. And ladies and gentlemen, you already know, if, if you know how to use podcast programs, you already know which hat we're talking about today. It's in the title. It took us a long time to figure that out. The first few episodes have this whole big uh, lead up and reveal, um, but everybody already knew. Uh, and I know that we talk about this every time, so if you're listening to these in a row, I'm sorry. But today, uh, today when we're recording, and you will not be listening to this on this day unless it's exactly one, two, three, four, or some, you know, set of integers right. away in years from today, it's July 4th. That's right. Independence Day. It is the anniversary of when the uh, U.S. Uh, Revolutionary War began. Yes. Uh, exciting times, right? I certainly would have been a, a, either exciting or upsetting. Oh, probably deeply, time. deeply upsetting for some people. Um, even if you were in favor of it, the knowledge that, well, there's a war going on. Oh, yeah, and even for the signers, it, it didn't turn out well for most not all of them. Of them yeah. yeah. But, you know, the world is... As it is today, in large part because of those events, and so we, right. we remember it. Um, War, what is it good for? Inspiring barbecues, hundreds of years later. Right, and fireworks shows. Yes. Uh, so. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we always begin, and, and that is prelude to the hat we've chosen. Because one thing about the 4th of July is it, it happens in July, as, as revealed by the name of the date. Yes. And that means it's very hot. It is hot. It's been very hot. It's been a very hot week. Yes. Um, I'm lucky to work in an air-conditioned office, but that just kind of makes going in and outside a little bit more jarring. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's easier when you're not in an air-conditioned space on a hot day. I find that also, yes. Um, like at home, I don't have air conditioners. I just have fans just to keep the air moving. And it makes it much easier to go mm -hmm. in and out without it being a shock. Um, and at the time of the Revolutionary War, they did not have air conditioners in most homes. That's true. It's all about cross ventilation. Uh, that's right. Yeah, especially in southern homes. Uh, so we chose a warm weather hat. We did actually a warm weather hat specifically meant for cooling you down. That's right. And we chose a hat, the pith helmet. I'll reveal it to those yeah. who can't read. The pith helmet. I don't know how you found the podcast if you can't read. Is also a symbol of empire. Yes, in yes. certain senses. And so, what what better day to talk about? A hat that is about cooling down and symbolizing imperial aspirations than on a very hot day uh, on which we celebrate freedom from empire. Right. And you're probably not listening to this on the 4th of July unless you wait a year because we're recording it now and it's going to be edited and uploaded later. But but we are clever enough to understand yes. and appreciate the, uh, the very, very, very uh, fun association. Yes. Now, before we get to talking about the hat itself... Which we, we will do we, at length. We should get to correspondence. Oh, right. You said we have had correspondence from someone who is unknown to us. That's right. It says, Gentlemen, I trust this email finds you well. As a longtime fancier of all things head garb, I was thrilled to discover your delightful podcast. I began binge listening recently, and I'm presently enjoying episode 11. Having skimmed ahead at titles in queue, one question, if I may be bold, did the two of you chaps decide to abstain from an episode on the almighty Fedora until season two? Adoringly yours, Scott the Peaceful Shaver Leslie. Peace. You know, we've not done the Fedora. We haven't. And it, noticed. it hasn't been something... It, it isn't entirely unintentional that we haven't done it either, right? Right. We sort of we sort of try to save the big ticket hats, right? The, yeah. For special occasions. And it hasn't always worked out. Um, I, well, we started with the bowler hat. We did. Well, but that's the first episode is probably the, the most is special a big, occasion, is the biggest right? of tickets. Right. Um, yeah. So yeah, we're we're waiting for it. We want to do it right. Right. There's a there's a lot to talk about. And maybe it's going to be a two parter. We've never done a two part oh, that's episode. True, yeah. That could be fun. One whole one hour on, the, on just the one front hat. half of a fedora and another on the back half of a fedora. <laughs> <laughs> or one part 
on the hat and another on the ribbon that goes oh, around that's it. Oh, true, yes. One hour on the ribbon. No, but I, I, I think you're right. I, I think that the fedora is a very large topic because there's so many different wearers of them, so many associations, so many styles of fedora. Yes, and a lot, I mean, even just the history could take up a half hour. It's right? a lot to take on. Yeah. So I, I certainly think we should do it. But his question also brings up another uh, subject here, which is seasons. Oh, yeah. How, how do we differentiate seasons? Is that something podcasts do? Some of them do. Okay. Some of them do a season of so many episodes and then pause for a while. Okay. I think that what's going to happen, dear listener, uh, is there will be occasional pauses when life becomes busy, and hopefully those are relatively infrequent. I, I guess we could even... Is this season two? It could be. This uh, is our first break where we've gone uh, a More couple a week weeks. Yeah. Well, you know what I think we, sh- we could do? is Now, usually when, you, when we talk about television, yeah. in most cases, people will say this was the 1987 season and then right. the next year was the Oh, it could just be done season. in the year. Yeah. Yeah. So we can say, and this I think would also be quite appropriate, if we said we'll do the fedora on the first anniversary of Hatcast. Okay, which is sometime in February, I think. I think right? so, yes. yeah. So that's that's coming up yeah, soon it, enough. Yeah, yeah, ish. Yeah. So, Scott, uh, keep listening, I, I hope. Yeah, this is this is just for you, Scott, to make you listen through another six months' worth of HatCast. And we'll vow right now, we'll speak about the fedora mm-hmm. on the first anniversary, and we'll call that the 2019 season. Well, I'm, I'm actually going to wash my hands of this whole seasons thing. And I'm going to leave that up to my future biographers to figure out. All right. Yeah. Well, they'll give you uh, opus numbers yes. or catalog numbers, or Kreutzer numbers, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, there is a I, I, there is a British radio show called Just a Minute, which I love. Yes. I'm, uh, you've introduced me to it, and I love it, too. It's, it's been on for now 51 years, but it has 80-something seasons because they do more than one a year very often. Right. Oh, well, that's pretty... Well, there are, what, technically four seasons in a year. Imagine if that's how seasons yeah, yes. kind of work out. <laughs> well, <laughs> well this, this is our third season. We started in winter, and now it's summer. Right, and there's spring in between. No. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> Fall is next. There are four. <laughs> why, why should I do my seasons in The order? calendar year and the seasons are tricky. Anyway, that's, that's a digression that doesn't need to be yeah, gone yes. through right now. Um, we should probably get to the topic at hand. Yes, but thank you for your letter, Scott. And uh, other listeners, or Scott, as a, a repeat correspondent, if you want to write to us, the email address is hatcast at yandex.com. That's true. You could you could have two firsts. You could be the first person who isn't a friend of ours to write to us, uh, and you could be the first person to be a person who isn't a friend of ours to write to us more than once. We look That's forward right. to hearing from you. Now let's go on to the hat of the day, the pith helmet. Do you have a pith helmet? I have several. Um, oh yes, I do. Oh, well, uh, actually, I knew that already. When we've established that you have a corduroy pith helmet, which sort of defeats the point. It, it is. It is the least. It is the hat that is made out of a material which is so poorly suited to the function of the hat that I love it. Right. Mm. It is. It is an exercise in contradiction. Um, we've talked about it before, so we don't have to describe it at length. It is exactly what it sounds like: a pith helmet made of corduroy that is olive green. I like the color. Um, it's good looking hat. It's oh, it looks great. Strange. It's kind of like if you th- think that you want to keep the sun out of your eyes on a particularly brisk uh, fall day while well, you'll be out on a walk, maybe bird watching. You know? And you've that's... still chosen something inefficient to do that with. Right. That's that's really the only context well, I can see. They sort of born. bobble on your head, don't they? They do. They look a little funny because um, they're meant to be loose fitting to allow for circulation of yeah. air. Um, yeah, I guess we should, before we talk about the weirdest example of a pith helmet we should just talk in general about the structure of the one because itself. it's actually got a lot more engineering than your average hat um it is it sits on a band usually leather but it could be some other material i've usually seen leather but yeah, yeah around your head and then there is spacing um usually from leather or bits of cork and things right, like that right it's almost a sort of leather structure inside or right upon a which a hat balances, balances. Uh, and the hat's usually made out of pith, which is a cork-like material from, I think, is it Vietnam originally? Uh, or is it largely grown in Vietnam? But it's a, a lightweight, spongy material, kind of like cork. They they also make them out of cork. And then on top of that is a cloth, usually canvas lining, um, mm-hmm. or outer shell, and then a lining on the inside as well. Um, 
The idea being that one, it being suspended from your head allows for circulation of air, keeping you cool, uh, and also allowing uh, it to be a much larger hat that protects you from sun coming down right. onto you uh, without you having to figure out how to arrange it like a big floppy straw hat. Um, and then it has the added and really brilliant benefit of being able to be dipped in water and you can wear it on your head without your head getting wet. Uh, and as the water evaporates, it creates a cooling effect. It cools effect. you, yes. And so if it rains also, your hat is not destroyed. Right, and your head isn't particularly wet either. No, it's it's wonderfully useful in that regard. There are different shapes of it. It's usually fairly broad-brimmed, but we're looking at a picture now of T.E. Lawrence wearing one which is... That's pretty big. <laughs> it's pretty big, but it's not broad-brimmed. Right. Well, it's if if we were to look at him from the side, you would see it projects... Forward and back. Forward yeah, and back. Because you do want shade. Yes. It's not a pith cap. No. <laughs> oh, and that's other thing. It is, it is a helmet, right? Yes. It's, it, it's that, hard. That, that it is. It's, and that level of separation between your head and the helmet itself gives you an extra layer of protection should you be hit on the head with something. Right. So A falling fruit of some variety, right. perhaps. Which was one of the major uh, benefits of wearing it, especially if you were exploring some sort of, uh, you know, area with right. a lot of canopy and fruit and right. For seeds. fruit protection, a Carmen Miranda hat would not protect you quite as well. Uh, no, I think that would be, you're kind of inviting hazard at that point. You're <laughs> yes. more likely to have fruit from your hat fall on you, um, <laughs> and that would probably just get messy. Yeah, I, yes. I love the idea of devoting a whole episode to a Carmen Miranda hat, but there's not much to talk about other than it's fruit and it's on your head. Well, yeah, I, you know, I think we could talk about who who came up with it, who designed it. Right, the that's The film true. it was in, the whether it spawned further fruit hats and other people. Yeah. We could go into each fruit. I remember bananas and grapes, but I don't remember what other fruit were on that hat. That's true. Yeah, I guess we could we could catalog every type of fruit that was ever worn in a hat like that. I have to say, if I were Carmen Miranda wearing that hat, I would fully take advantage of the opportunity to doubt everything by saying, if that's true, I'll eat my hat. <laughs> uh. Well, back to the pith helmet. Um, so, so as you mentioned, there are a whole... There's a wide variety of shapes that the pith helmet can come right. in. Right. And those different shapes often got associated with different nations and military organizations that wore them. Right. So it originally it's f existed as early as the 1840s. Around 1870s, it became popular with military personnel in the colonies of Europe, tropical colonies, of course. And it says, was originally made of pith with small peaks or bills at the front or back, covered with white cloth, with a cloth band, and with holes for ventilation. The ones we see now are often, look more like straw hats. Yes, I've even seen ones that are w kind of a wicker material. Yeah. Um, I've, the, I, of the pith helmets that I own, only one of them, and I don't have it here with me, uh, is actually made pith. of pith or cork. I think it's cork. But it's at least closer in spirit to um, uh -huh. what a pith helmet should be. So the pith element of pith helmet refers to the material pith. Right. But it also refers to a form and function of hat right. associated with pith. And you might know it as by other names like the safari hat or the explorer hat or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, that's a pretty common association with it. Yes. How many pith helmets do you have? I Well, I have one real pith helmet. Uh -huh. And then I have the corduroy Right. Pith helmet shaped hat. And I have a canvas over some sort of um, pressed cardboard that looks very much like a pith helmet, but it was probably meant for costume it use. Probably is good wearing, too. Yeah, it would definitely keep the sun out. But, yeah, well, oh. we're looking at Winston Churchill wearing one here. Well, he's holding one. In he's holding it. It looks rather like a tortoise, actually. It's kind of a squared off. It's sort helmet. of a buckle across the dome of the hat. Yeah. With holes in it. Now, I don't own a pith helmet. That one looks pretty good. Churchill was a stylish guy. He's got his white suit. He does. Nothing better than a white suit. I have to break mine out at some point. He doesn't have the bow tie. I do prefer the bow tie. Yeah, he didn't always wear the bow tie, though. No. Um, and a bow tie, I feel like, uh, would be less practical in a tropical climate because um, It would be you can't more likely it. to get sweat-soaked through your shirt. Right. Whereas, a, you know, a regular foreign hand, you can 
make as tight or as loose as yeah, you want. Yeah, he was wearing that loose. But you have a whole book on Churchill's style, don't you? I do. Yeah, it might be a, a fun thing to review that book um, and just point out all the hats. The hat elements, yeah. Yeah, because he did like his hats. Now, I don't own a pith helmet, but I did recently have opportunity to wear one in public. In a play, right? Yes. Ah. I was playing a character who thinks he is Theodore Roosevelt. Okay. In Arsenic and Old Lace by Joseph Kesselring, if anyone a renowned is familiar with that. Explorer of the Amazon. Oh, not Kesselring. Roosevelt, 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 not Kesselring. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, the character, his name is also Teddy, is convinced that the basement of his house is Panama. Okay. And is going on expeditions there and wears his pith helmet to do so. Right. As so one does. It's a, it's a, it's an enjoyable hat to wear. It does give one the feeling of exploration, but I think it would also be very. I think it also would be very practicable. Oh, uh, it it really is. Now there are some problems with wearing it now because of the immediate association with. No, I guess not so much exploration. That's that's sort of fine. People aren't too upset about that. But the immediate association with colonial powers and it being sort of the military symbol of colonial powers for a good. 90 years. Yes. Although, do you, do you think that's... Is that your first thought when you see it? I If I see someone in a pith helmet, my first thought is this is someone trying to beat the heat. That's true. You know, I guess it depends on the context where you see it, right? If you're at the beach or going on a hike through a particularly, like, muggy place. Uh, like, yeah. Uh, or in the desert. I guess you wouldn't have that thought. Uh, even if it was a hot day, though, and I saw someone wearing it like on a city street, I would think this person is eccentric or some sort of uh, crypto imperialist. Yeah. Now, my the, the place I see this most often is on mailmen. Is it still? I, I know yeah. that it had been part of the letter carrier uniform in the summer. Is it still? Uh, I, yes, and I still see them wearing them. It seems odd. And I the first time I saw it, I just thought that, it was a very eccentric mailman <laughs> wearing a pith helmet, but apparently it's part of the optional uniform. Huh. Well, and you know what, though? It is perfect for it. If you're outside all day in the summer and have to deal with things like heat and humidity and even dry heat and rain, I mean, it's perfect for protecting you from every one of those right. things. I mean, their job is walking around all day in the weather. Right. Which sometimes is very nice, but I'm sure it's sometimes unpleasant when it's extremely hot. Right. I mean, it is all around a very practical hat. Right. It's the kind of hat you could wear in any warm or, you know, temperate situation and be comfortable in. Uh, it wouldn't do you much good in the cold, no. but it wouldn't cause you any harm either. Um, you might miss the opportunity to put a warmer hat on. Right. But other than that, no. I I don't know if I would have thought of crypto imperialist. I mean, it's a good costume element, also. That's true. If you're trying to give the impression of a you know that's Raj, uh, official or Amazonian explorer. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm I think I'm thinking too deeply into this. I think most people would think, oh, maybe this person's a little bit costume or a little bit eccentric. I think that unless you were like wearing it in a former colony somewhere. Uh, most people wouldn't think of you as being particularly insensitive. Right, and I think even if you were, well, let's say, what what would you think? Well, all right. (laughs) Let's say I went to the Congo. I still think it would be practical to wear a pith helmet if it's very hot. It would it would be the most practical hat you could wear. It's true. It's it's a very well designed hat. Yeah, Yeah. I guess you know this this whole. Part of the discussion is based on my very strong desire to wear a pith helmet all summer long <laughs> and my fear that it would be taken the wrong way. Right. right. And that's that's where that's where this is coming from. Um, and I think you're helping me get past some of those fears. Yeah, I, um, I don't think you need to be afraid. Um, we have some we have some quotations from from sources here. 1862 Chambers is Edinburgh Journal. Yeah, this so this is something that I'm curious about. Like wh- when that transition to wearing the pith helmet happened, because there were Europeans in tropical parts of the world mm-hmm. uh, doing exploration or you know carrying out uh, imperial duties and things like that, and they did not wear the pith helmet. Uh, I mean, oftentimes they would adopt whatever the local dress was. Uh-huh. 
Well, this one's 1862. This is an article all about hats from Chambers' journal. Not, not signed, sadly enough. That's okay. I mean, it's just, uh, still a valuable resource. It says, Hitherto I have spoken of the true hat, conventionally so-called, of the felt hat, which was utterly unknown to our ancestors until the time of the Crusades. Further east, hats were continually worn, but they were made of vegetable substances. In India, the Malayan archipelago, in China, in Siam, and Burma, hats are made of straw, of rattan, and a variety of broad-stemmed grasses. The straw hat is merely for shade. The rattan and bamboo hats more often assume a helmet shape than that of a cylinder, and are often useful in deadening the blow of a club. But the pith hat is an invaluable protection against sunstroke. So that's not really talking about it as a European hat. No, and it, I, 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 research has suggested, and this backs that up, that it wasn't a European hat. It was a hat that was adopted by Europeans because it was very practical. This is from 1882. It's called On Duty Under a Tropical Sun by Shelley Lee Hunt. And he disagrees with the point that we made earlier. If required to wear an especially dry climate, Egypt, for example, pith would be the most suitable material to select as being lighter than either cork or felt. But remember, a pith hat is useless in a wet climate. Becoming saturated with rain, its weight is enormously increased. It loses its shape and soon falls to pieces. Interesting. So I think you would you would maybe dip the hat and let the evaporation cool you, but you wouldn't want it getting You wouldn't want to be so constantly wet. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. I guess I I had a th- I, that, I guess that would make sense. In a in a rainy climate, it would get very heavy. Yeah. Well, that's why we do this, to learn. Alice M. Hayes writes about a different situation. The Horsewoman, a practical guide to side saddle riding in 1893. For tropical climates, the pith hat, or sola topi, is best for use in hot weather. Helmets, besides being apt to give one a headache on account of their weight, do not afford sufficient protection to the rider's temples from the sun. The double terai hat of gray felt is becoming, but it is very heavy. Pith is the lightest and most suitable for wear during intense heat. Ladies in hot countries should avoid wearing a small hat when the sun is above the horizon, for its rays are very treacherous, even in the cold weather. I have had many a splitting headache from disregard of this precaution. So this brings up the point that, of course, the pith helmet is a pretty unisex hat. Yes, you see plenty of photographs of both men and women wearing it, and without it changing much in size or shape right right it's it's the pith helmet um, i think you don't usually see the broadest brimmed pith helmets on women wearing them mm-hmm. but it in general it's fairly evenly distributed this is from the journal of the association of military surgeons of the united states from 1906 the lightest forms of headgear that i could find were the old white or khaki cap fairly standard i had a khaki cap mm-hmm. i enjoyed that the stetson and the pith helmet weighing 100, 125, and 195 grams, respectively. Other forms of helmets weighed much more. It's odd how they're they're make, taking pains to point out that other forms of helmets are much weightier than the pith helmet in many sources. It's, it's sort of... It's, this thing, which is made of a lightweight plant and canvas, is lighter than a hat made of metal. For instance, <laughs> the German private's helmet was 403 grams, which is entirely too heavy. <laughs> The next matter of consequence is that the headpiece should protect the eyes, the sides of the head and the nape of the neck, emphasis theirs. Both the campaign hat and the pith helmet do this sufficiently. The latter has a front visor two and one half inches long, with a drop of 35 degrees, the back visor being three and one half inches long, with a drop of 45 degrees, and turning slightly toward the horizontal at the end. The sides of the pith helmet are one and one eighth inches wide, with a drop of 25 degrees. The visors are lined with green cloth. This is some very exact material about this military headgear yeah. at the time. It is It is great. Um, well, it was part of uniforms. Yeah. So it had to be documented. Yeah. And over the course of this few decades, it became a sort of exotic thing that you should pick up on your travels to a, an exact regimented part of many military uniforms. Here is uh, Henry Haversham Godwin Austin. That's a name. <laughs> Certainly is. I, 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 uh... Henry Haversham Godwin Austin. Yes, from the Royal Geographical Society in 1883, his Hints to Travelers. I might want to read that whole book. I think it's worth doing. But this looks like a particularly 
Yes. Good quotation right here. In tropical countries, the head and spine should be effectively protected. The level rays of the sun at morn or, at, or eve, the, the level rays of the sun at morn or eve, are often more dangerous than the vertical. The well-fitting ventilated pith helmet, which forms such an effective guard against the midday sun, does not equally protect the sides of the head and the back of the neck from its horizontal rays at morn or eve. At such times, therefore, a light curtain of sufficient length should be attached to the rim of the helmet. This curtain, at other times, can be folded up and fastened round the helmet. If the head and spine be well protected, the latter may be guarded by a double fold of flannel about three inches wide, sewn on the back of the shirt from the neckband to the loins, and spiritous liquors be avoided or taken with great moderation, the traveler or sportsman in the tropics need not fear exposure, even to the midday sun. The writer, wearing a pith helmet, a flannel shirt, and belt, and linen trousers, has for weeks successively, from sunrise to noon, traversed on foot, without the slightest injury to health, miles of tropical districts, when engaged in collecting zoological specimens. It may be added, however, that the ordinary traveler will do well in availing himself of the protection afforded by a light, white-covered umbrella. A folding Panama straw hat may be used with advantage in subtropical climates. Only mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. Yes. I, we may have our song. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and this gentleman sounds like very much an Englishman. Yeah. Not a mad dog, I was. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it is funny how often he has to say, and it's okay to be out in the midday. You'll be all right. Yes. As long as you wear this hat and put a scarf on and maybe have an umbrella and don't drink and... <laughs> Yes. I mean, one, ha one has to remember, what are one of the stereotypes of England? Cold, rainy, foggy. Right. And what is a tropical place? Not that. <laughs> well, perhaps misty rather than foggy. Right. So Englishmen can be forgiven, I think, wanting to experience the midday sun. Right. Well, that's the pith helmet. You know, it, that went by very quickly. Yes. Do you think we need a pith helmet part two? Um, no, I think we covered it. I think that we helped alleviate my fear of wearing my pith helmet out and about. And I, I'm, my appetite is wet to, to acquire a pith helmet. Uh, there's, uh, there are some good online resources for doing that. And so I, I'll, uh, I'll walk you through that. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, and I, I should get a new one as well because, um, the one that I have that is actual, uh, pith is kind of small for me so mm -hmm. uh, well let's rate the pith helmet um well i'm going to start on practicality yeah and i am going to give it i have to give it 9.5 i was all right i was almost going to give it a 10 but then when you said 9.5 i remembered that passage about wearing it in tropical climes right where if it gets too rainy it can get heavy yeah. that's the only reason why i'm taking off a 0.5 and that was a new discovery for me yeah so I, I completely agree with you. Style. It looks good, doesn't it? Does it does look good. It is. I mean, it, you put that on and you you feel like you're about to do something. Winston Churchill approved. Right. Um, oh. Now, it, it's not entirely versatile. Um, no. I mean, imagine driving a car in one. You'd, you wouldn't fit in the car. Um, Pulling it off as you enter a business meeting. You'd look a little goofy. Um yeah, there are there are some style situations where it's completely inappropriate. Yes, um, you wouldn't want to wear it like on a, even if it's a hot day uh, in in a city. You don't really wear it in a city. It's not it's city a, wear. No, it's a it's a big hat. You're gonna bump into things. Yeah, so maybe a seven. I would give it a seven. I'm gonna give it an eight. All right, that's a fair choice as well. Look, it's an eight point five. I uh, and rightly so. That's a, a very good score for a hat that deserves one. Well, we hope you enjoy the pith helmet if you like that sort of thing. We'll be back next week. I think next week, should we reveal what we're planning? Well, yes, we should. Yeah, we can talk about it. We should give you an assignment. Oh, that's right. If you want to follow along. Yes. Uh, so we have read a story about hats. That's right. Well, a story with hats in the title that does And involve... the, in the story. In the, in the story, there are hats. <laughs> What's it called, Charles? It's, it's called The Amazing Hat Mystery. The Amazing Hat Mystery. It's by Sir Pelham Grenville Woodhouse. A... Favorite author of yes, mine. Yes, and of mine. And you can find it in his sh short story collection, Young Men in Spats. Don't get confused. It's not called Young Men in Hats. Sounds kind of similar, but these go on your feet. Yes, the opposite end of your body. Don't confuse them. 
<laughs> Although, it, was the phrase from spats to hats ever used to describe, like, completeness? I'm not sure, but it sounds right. I'm coining it right now. Uh, we're going to cover that story from spats to hats. Yes. Well, anyway, so if you would like to follow along on our discussion, this will be our first episode that's not about a particular kind of hat, but rather about a hat in a literary production. Right. When we've talked about hats in literature, and now we're going to talk about literature in hats. Yes. So it's, again, what, The Amazing Hat Mystery by P.G. Woodhouse. All right. So if you read along, we can all have a, a good little discussion next yes, week. Yes. And once again, if you'd like to write to us, it's hatcast at yandex.com, H-A-T-C-A-S-T, at Y-A-N-D-E-X dot C-O-M. Looking forward to hearing from you. Goodbye. Bye. In the Philippines, they have lovely screens to protect you from the glare. In the Malay states, there are hats like plates which the Britishers won't wear. At 12 noon, the natives swoon and no further work is done. But mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. It's such a surprise for the Eastern eyes to see that though the English are effete, they're quite impervious to heat. When the white man rides, every native hides in glee. Because the simple creatures hope he will impale his solar topi on a tree.